Well, Tracy, my um, and everybody, my camera is not working again. I don't know what's wrong. I think it's something on my laptop end. Um, oh, I saw you briefly. Yeah, it's just now it's just decided it doesn't want to work. So I will be oh, here. Dear. You just probably okay. You're the you're me. the logo. Yeah, I'll be the talking logo. So talking logo. Okay. Um, we do, and we I do have, seem and to I'm have in the a... middle of a real really I'm in the middle of a really bad windstorm. So okay. at any my internet or my power uh may go out. So if I disappear, that's why. Okay. Understood. So, um it's raining at my house, so who knows? But we'll we'll go ahead and get started and we'll just do the best we can. Um Okay. If uh, you don't, if you aren't muted, if you could just go ahead and mute, um, since we do have a big group, that would be helpful. And then unmute when you talk. Um, but we can go ahead and get started. Tracy, since you can be seen, do you want to go ahead and open? Okay, well, I'm very excited to see so many people uh, logged on here to our very first uh, Behind the Lines Book Club meeting of 2024. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Um, I'm hoping that we have some return folks from last year and some new folks that are just decided to, uh, to join us for this year. Uh, so our very first book that we decided to pick is The Woman They Could Not Silence. Uh, by Kate Moore. Uh, Rachel actually uh, got me interested in this book, and I personally couldn't put it down. I thought it was amazing, uh, very addictive reading. Uh, I had not heard of Elizabeth Packard before, uh, and I found her story just so great and so compelling that I decided that that would probably be a really good choice for our book club to start things off this year. Um, and thankfully, when I contacted the author, Kate Moore, uh, she was more than willing to uh, to come on and, and speak with us. Uh, now, she's over in the UK, so it's uh, about 10 o'clock at night for her. Um, but uh, she should be signing on shortly to uh, to have a discussion with us. Um, but in the meantime, if we want to get started here and, and talk about uh, what other people's impressions were uh, of this book, I, I know I loved it. I know Rachel loved it. Uh, what are, what do other folks have to say? I found it horrifying. I was it was it was one of the most terrifying reads to begin with, because. Mm -hmm. This was the reality in the 1800s. And for many women, that reality hasn't changed in the 21st century. And it was heartbreaking for so much of it to read just how persistent and consistent the abuse was and how there were no resources. And even at this point in time, I'm sure that, you know, sadly, there are many women around the world who are still experiencing that same thing. I mean, it will, the, the, the woman was absolutely remarkable. I mean, she's my new hero, but there are really, I don't know very many women who would have that kind of strength and fortitude to just keep fighting every single day against every single odd. It was, it was, it, the, the book took me in, a hundred different directions and I'm still processing. Well, that's that's very true. And and when I first started it, I, I kept saying to myself, this better have a happy ending. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it did for, for Elizabeth Packard, obviously, but as you say, it's still relevant today. And the fact that, uh, you know, there are so many women um, that are uh, being at, at as that example in in the the last part of the book, you know, with uh, that she talks about Nancy Pelosi. I mean, they're they're women are being gaslighted today. Um, you know, they're 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 being told that they're crazy or or whatever just because they're outspoken and have have different ideas. So I I mean, it's totally a relatable today, and in a way, I find that sad that that it's still going on. For me, it's more than sad. For me, it's it's so beyond disgusting that I feel powerless. I just feel, I feel like if I had 
half of this woman's brains and guts, I would be able to do something to make something change. And whether I just lack that or whether I just give up or whether it's that now I'm retired, so I let everybody else do everything. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but I don't know how this is still going on. It, it literally drives me nuts. Uh, yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, I have to tell you, I bought the book to read it because I was so fascinated by the the title and reading what I read of it. And then my I told my wife about it. I said, you've got to read this. And she immediately snatched the book from me. And I haven't got that back yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing with a book like this, too, is is uh, at least for me, I want to pass pass it on. I want to get the word out there and and make people aware of this amazing woman and make people aware of this horrible problem that that unfortunately still exists today and and i mean i just um i can't say enough about kate moore's writing style where it just brought me into the story so that i didn't want to put it down i just needed to find out uh what was going on and, and how she was handling it and it was just it was exhilarating and heartbreaking and all of the things, all the adjectives I can't think of off the top of my head. <laughs> yeah, um, I I do have to agree. I thought it was very well written in terms of the readability and, and drawing the reader in. I had a hard time putting it down and I had just finished a, a, a book that was about a thousand pages long. So when I saw this one, I thought, oh boy, here we go again. But um, it was very captivating and um i found a lot of different emotions i mean it was maddening and depressing in some places but i um i found it i don't know that exhilarating is the right word but i i found it very uplifting um just looking at the idea that you really cannot squash the human spirit um, and their desire for, you know, freedom or, you know, the ability to do what what they think they're meant to do in life um, or to hold their own opinions. Um, and so in that way, I, I found it very inspiring and uplifting in a way. Um, here's a woman who found a way and it took her a long time, but she found a way. And and I think that's true of, of the human spirit in general. So, um Yes, it's it's hard to see that some of this still goes on in um, in certain ways, but I also think you have to look at the fact that because of women like Elizabeth Packard, things are so much better than they were. Um, and I think, especially when it comes to the institutions and the asylums, um, I think men suffered a great deal as well. So. While some of the things were peculiar to women's institutions, I think as a whole, um, you know, you have to look at that aspect of it as well. It wasn't right. just a women's issue. And and as as uh, since uh, uh, Rachel and I are with the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, uh, mm -hmm. I I feel the need to also address the fact that um, yes, it was uh, the mental institutions of the 19th century were horrible places. And uh, the the men that were coming home from the war with PTSD, which nobody knew what it was, nobody understood it. Exactly. Um, a lot of them ended up in these places, which is absolutely tragic. Um, yeah, and especially since so many of them were addicted to some of the medicines of the day. Right, right. Yeah, the opioid, opioid addiction was was huge. <laughs> right, but I think. With uh, with Elizabeth Packard's experience, it's 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 unique in the fact that um, her husband was wow. able to commit her, even though she was perfectly sane, and that was perfectly legal. Go right, um, and mm -hmm. and that just blew my mind. That um, you know, and 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 he 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 didn't have to to really prove it. He just got a doctor's signature on a certificate, and mm -hmm. and, and away she went, and it was just. I, I I guess I, I was kind of aware of that sort of thing, just having known Mary Todd Lincoln's experiences 
um, yeah. also being committed yeah. that I, I was at least had a basic idea of you know what it what ensued then. So um, so it wasn't a surprise uh, to me. It's still horrifying. I agree, but it wasn't a surprise. Right. The practice goes back well beyond the 1800s, though. That oh. practice was going on in the 15, 14, 15, 1600s in England. And that was just a common, common knowledge that, you know, if you were a king, you could cut your wife's head off. But if you weren't a king, you could send her to a mental institution. <laughs> and there was no regard to, for children. There was no regard for welfare. It was just a matter of fact. Yeah. Or and, you could call her a witch. And be exactly. Done with it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Steve, you uh, have your hand out. Um, you yes. want to go ahead? Yes, uh, I was going to mention that I found a, uh, it's a great book. It's a fantastic read. And I was really fascinated sort of uh, on three levels, I think, at the same time while I was reading. Uh, Elizabeth Packard's story, I think, is second to none. You'd be hard pressed to find uh, a story like that in uh, all of American history, I think, that captures so many unique uh, elements of personal challenge social reforms uh, at a time that there was so much going on. I think the other thing I liked too was uh, gave you more context into uh, uh, how she contributed to and how the issue of reform for the support of the people who are suffering mentally all sort of dovetailed with a lot of other reform efforts and uh, the Civil War dro drove part of that. I have a big interest in Civil War history. And so the issues that veterans faced when they came home and the mindset, I think, of many Americans uh, because of the war uh, facing a whole different set of challenges and, and the roles that women had to assume during the war may have opened the door just a little bit for a degree of, uh, of being more receptive to these reforms than what they had been previously. So I, I think all of that's very fascinating in the way that uh, reform for mental institutions, for support of uh, people with mental health issues and the way the institutions were run, uh, support for veterans. Uh, none of these things could be imagined uh, on that scale beforehand. And then by the end of the century, there's significant progress you know, for, for all of that. I, I think many of us here tonight uh, have grandmothers or great grandmothers for certain who in my own case, couldn't vote until they were almost 40 years old. And you need to think about that once in a while, the life they lived before that happened. And if you have ancestors also who uh, were separated uh, or tried to divorce, or uh, uh, a grandmother whose husband died unexpectedly and there was no will, and there was a large family and how property was divided and the incredible disadvantage that put women at uh, who were in those circumstances. And then the third thing I really like about the book is, and I'll be interested in hearing, is how she put it together. Uh, it, it was one who dabbles in some of that writing. It's just an enormous undertaking. And so I'll be interested in hear, hearing more about her organizational methods. And, and uh, nonfiction is really hard to pull off well, balancing between... Uh, uh, the facts and when do you take appropriate liberties with maybe fictionalizing a little bit as to what probably happened based on the clues. So I'm curious to hear more about how she put that together. Great. Great. Well, uh, I'm sure she'll be happy to answer that. Uh, Cindy, you got your hand up there. Yes. I'd, I'd like to echo everybody's sentiments. I thought this book could take you on so many paths of issues with society. And one in particular that stood out to me was in the name of religion, you could tell somebody they were insane. Um, I, I just thought that was interesting. And the mm -hmm. other thing that I thought was fascinating was how long this doctor continued on being viewed as this wonderful person who really knew what was going on and he continued to stay in the system all those years, unbelievable. Well, 
Yeah, and and um, I think if I remember correctly, he had a memorial plaque or something put up to him and yeah. uh, put up for him, and and it's it's just it's mind blowing that the the, uh, the whitewashing, I guess, that 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 went on as far as his reputation went. Yeah, that was pretty unsettling to me to read how revered he was knowing how he had treated her and other women as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and that's something that that was um I find my I found myself throughout this book alternately uh cheering her on and then getting mad at her because she would fall for his story over and over and over she'd be oh no now he's my friend now he's really trying to help me dr mcfarland and now he's really trying to help me and i'm, I'm like don't no don't fall for it he's trying he's fooling you don't believe them and and so throughout the book i'm i'm struggling to be you know i just want to shake her and say hey you know this, this don't go for don't fall for it <laughs> uh, kathy you're muted I found that interesting as well. Um, and for a while I, I was in the same mindset. I, I was like, oh, how can you be so naive? You're gonna do this again, kind mm -hmm. of a mindset. And then I thought, you know, maybe this is almost like a Stockholm syndrome going yes. on, that she really was um, so dependent on him that she did, like subconsciously really want to believe and buy into all the lies he was telling her. Um, yes, yeah, she was so desperate for for an ally. That... Well, not only an ally, but he truly held her entire fate in his hands. And so mm -hmm. I think you want to believe that they're not going to be the cruelest of all. So, yeah. Yeah, but that was interesting. Yeah, Stockholm syndrome was the first thing that entered my mind. Uh, I was like, no, you can't, don't fall for it. <laughs> I liked how uh Kate wrote that to where you weren't quite sure was he really on her side? Had he mm. switched? Was he really, you know, didn't have these bad intentions? And then you kind of find out, oh yeah, okay. So he's really not that nice. But I thought that was really clever how she she did that. It it kept you interested and and it was sort of like a mystery. Okay, how is this guy going to really turn out? You know, mm -hmm. yeah, agreed. Yeah. That was that was very clever. I find you were rooting for him, that you really did feel he was on her side and she was going to get helped and and there was something mm -hmm. about the way he presented himself that was so different from her husband and from so many of the men that had come up against her that I felt that there really was something solid and honest with this guy. And it was only subtle indications as she went through this until it started getting very obvious that you gave up on him altogether. And yet she didn't give up on him. She just kept, she kept finding it over and over a place of solace for her. And I would imagine that being in a mental institution, knowing that you're sane, knowing that many of the people around you are sane, but knowing also that there are a lot of insane people in there, you've got to, I, I would have questioned many of my own decisions. And yet Elizabeth seemed to keep making decisions that she felt very, very solid about and worked on them and worked through them. and. So many of them were based in just in human kindness, which doesn't seem like something that would flow in a place like these kinds of mental institutions, especially around that time when, you know, the horrors of those places, what she described were very true. Those were all real happenings. Right. And it was it was amazing, you know, that she found um other women that were in there under the same circumstances that she had been admitted mm -hmm. to uh you know that the same thing had happened to them and you know her trying to sort of bond with those with those women and, and try to get them you know on her side and try to change things and um you know it just it must have been so scary for all of them um to 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 wonder you know are are we ever going to get out of here is this ever going to change 
Well, part of the problem that that I kept bumping into was trying to impose 21st century morals and ethics on 19th century events. And I, I'm not trying to support or say what they said was right, but it, it speaks to today when we're talking about taking down monuments and those types of things. And I'm not trying to be political, but it is just difficult to look at the 19th century through a 21st century lens. Right. I don't I don't disagree with that, but I just don't think that that a basic attention to to the humanness in another human being has anything to do with a century. I think that there's there's always there's always input that can be made in a situation when you're dealing one on one with someone as a human being. And I think that, again, I don't think that that's, that's isolated to one century or another. I think that it's still happening in different places around the world now where we just see there is not an attention to the humanness that each of us hold. And that causes a lot of conflict. I mean, we're certainly seeing you can't stay, you can't keep politics out of something like this because that's what <laughs> that's what we're seeing. That's what politics is. Well, uh, Steve Gates made an interesting comment. I don't know if anybody saw it. Uh, he says um, the religious reforms going on during this time are also a fascinating sub story that drove reforms. Uh, several denominations experienced divisions, the Methodists, the Presbyterians, the Baptists, regarding abolition, women's rights, and theology. Um, he says, Kate Moore noted many of these in her book, and I would have enjoyed even more discussion on those topics. And in indeed, I think she incorporated some of that very well. But um, I think the book would have been super, super long if she'd gone <laughs> in depth on any of those topics. But it's it's nice that she did kind of put that in there as well. Renee also put in the comments, the doctor seemed to have cycles of interest and a subtle of gaslighting the individuals, which that's a really good mm -hmm. observation. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder, um, and they, the author alluded to this ever so briefly, but I would have liked to, or I just would have been interested in a little more discussion, but um, I'm wondering if that was almost like a technique that was used in terms of ferreting out the insanity and what the treatments might be. Is this, you know, like push and pull with them, um, with the inmates? Um, it might have been. Um, I don't know if anybody here is a, a classic movie buff, but I, I'm definitely a classic movie buff. And and I remember seeing the film Gaslight with Ingrid Bergman and Charles Boyer. And that's where that term gaslighting comes from, from that film. Mm -hmm. And it, it talks of it. The film is the story of a husband who's uh, trying to drive his wife insane or make her appear insane so that he can commit her and then get her fortune. Uh, and that's, you know, that's where the term gaslighting comes from, from that, from that uh, experience. When did that come out, Tracy? I'd like 1930s. It. It, was, it was a late, a late, I think it was late 1930s is when it came out. I want to say um, Angela Lansbury was in it. She was like a teenager. It was incredible. But it's a really good film. I highly recommend if anybody's into it. Yeah. One of the other things that struck me while reading this was um, the way that women's rights throughout at least American history have always been either associated with or tangential to uh, other issues that are going on, whether it was the emancipation of the slaves or whether it was prohibition or whether it was religious reform or whether it was uh, dealing with uh, the mental institutions, that there's always that piece of women's rights that keeps popping up through through all of those things. 
Yeah, that's that's a really good observation. And now that you're saying that, I'm I'm thinking of of all the different times where where reform was so prevalent in society, and and yeah, that they women's rights is paired with a lot of the other different reforms. That's that's a really interesting observation. Oh, somebody said Gaslight is a 1944 movie. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Somebody made a comment previously, too, that made me think uh, another topical area of the book that was fascinating and also deeply depressing, but also a reminder. And uh, I'll, I'll say this, and maybe at the risk of offending anybody who's a psychology major or a practicing psychiatrist, so I apologize ahead of time, but uh, the, the mindset of those who call themselves doctors and on the, uh, the ground level of what became psychology uh, have a really sad hundred years history uh, of many contributing to many atrocities and justifying them through their pseudoscience at the time. You can look at the, uh, what happened to Elizabeth Packard and the lack of science to support any of their claims for institutionalizing her. And then you can go right up to uh, years later to eugenics you can go to the uh, racial prioritization of uh, all nationalities that was celebrated at the World's Fair because of brain size and physical appearances. Uh, so it's really a sad reminder of uh, things that were justified through what they believed was science at the time, but really just privileged a handful of people who happened to be older white men in positions of power for a long time and how long it was to shake that structure. I mean, they also victimized, uh, again, a lot of veterans who were trying to recover and the way they uh, minimized their uh, uh, mental anguish and what became PS PTS, uh, those types of things before it was formally recognized. Anyway, uh, just another topic that, <laughs> that took me down a road of not feeling very happy, but a true part of the history. Yeah. yeah, that's true. And and Mary Elko wrote a, a, an interesting comment, too, about um, she says there seemed to be a given on the part of the board and administration that these wardens of the asylums were more knowledgeable than they really were based on their own reporting. There was no investigation as to whether these claims of expertise were true or false. And the fact that McFarland tolerated the abuse and turned a blind eye to what was going on. There was a large element of ego there. Um yeah, I mean, uh, you know, that was he a board certified psychiatrist? Um, no. <laughs> so that's, I, that's a good point. I think that's true of all medicine as you look back history. And, and this is, I think, part of the danger of uh, projecting, you know, 21st century knowledge and ideas back into history. Uh, I mean, even physical medicine was full of outrageous things that at the time was the best knowledge that they had. Right. Um, so I think we have to be a little careful. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's certainly been some horrors in, in all types of medicine um, before things were known. For sure. Tracy, um, I'm sorry, Kathy, were you done? I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, Kate is Kate Moore oh, is in the waiting room, so I oh, can go okay. ahead and admit her. Do you want to do a little, um, yeah, a little intro for that. her since you've been talking to her? Oh, okay. Well, uh, okay. Uh, just I'll go uh, ahead and let gonna, her in real quick. We're gonna bring uh, we're gonna bring yeah. Kate Moore, the uh, the wonderful author of this book, in uh, to our discussion. Uh, she is so uh, so gracious to agree to take part in our uh, in our discussion tonight. Um, she's over in the UK, as I said, uh, and it is about ten thirty at night over there. So so uh, many thanks to her for staying up late for our our discussion. Uh, she is a New York Times uh, and USA Today bestselling author. Um, this, the woman they could not silence is not her first book. Her first book is uh, 
The Radium Girls, which I also highly recommend. This is an amazing book written in the same yeah. wonderful style. Uh, and this this is, uh, it takes place a lot later than the 19th century. This is a 20th century book, but um, the story is just truly amazing as well. Um, Kate seems to have a knack for, uh, for finding really fascinating topics that have to do with uh, strong women. Uh, so I, I recommend that book as well. So uh, let's bring on uh, let's bring on Kate if she's on. Hello there. Hi. 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 <laughs> yeah, she's nice to see you again. <laughs> so we have a very large uh, contingency here that uh, are very enthusiastic about the book. Oh, thank so you. I will let folks. Uh, folks uh, start asking you some questions I guess unless you sure. unless you have like an opening statement or something <laughs> I, I think all I just want to say is thank you so much for choosing the book uh Tracy and you know shining a spotlight on Elizabeth Packard and of course to all of you for reading the book and for being interested uh to come along and you know talk about it tonight and I'm very happy to ask answer any questions that you have so you know hit me with whatever you've whatever you've got and I'm very happy to to join you and, and very grateful to you all for reading so thank you wonderful okay questions um I've never heard of Elizabeth Packard before your book and you're living in the UK how did you find her <laughs> um Google is the is the short answer um the long answer is that um I went looking for someone with Elizabeth's story. So it's sort of one of those funny things. I think often as a writer, you discover the person or the people you want to write about. And that's the starting point for a book. Whereas with the woman, they could not silence. It was a I'm bit sorry, it is um, because I actually started um, by deciding that I wanted to write about the silencing of women through the false claims that we're mad. Um, I was inspired by the Me Too movement and inspired in the sense of that was such an electrifying time. And what was different about from everything that had come before was that finally women were being listened to and believed. And that got me thinking, you know, why hasn't that happened before? How have women been silenced and discredited in the past? You know, it's not that women have not woken up. We have. It's that we've said has not been listened to and it's been undermined and disbelieved and I decided what I wanted to write about was the way that women you know are are sort of you know seen Christmas. through this prism of madness so that what we say do is you know shoved to one side and that decision is legitimized through this false claim of madness and so I then went looking for a woman in history a sane woman in history who had been accused of being mad when she used her voice, who wasn't. And there were so many stories that I could have chosen. And I actually started my research in the 20th century. But what I was discovering is that I could find plenty of sane women who'd been accused of being mad and who were locked up in institutions and so on. But in the 20th century, the treatments included things like electric shock therapies and lobotomies. And so far too many of those women that I found were actually silenced, you know, irre irrevocably. And so I go further back. And so I was researching, you know, lunacy in the 19th century, they called it. And this Google search, this sort of rabbit warren of trying to find one woman's story uh, that for me could represent like all, almost all of womankind. You know, I, I, I didn't want to write a polemic. I wanted to write this story of someone to whom this had happened. And I sort of ended up by internet searches in this University of Wisconsin essay that just happened to be online. And I was reading it and it was four pages in. There was just a single paragraph that referenced Elizabeth Packard and that's where I first that's read her name, idea. and that's how I read her story. Uh, wow, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very grateful to those University of Wisconsin students for, for putting their work online, and you know the fact that I was able to read it. You know, however many years it was after they had published that, you know, university paper, and that was the seed that 
then you know I was able to it was sort of like you know the the breadcrumb as it were and then you follow the trail and think oh my god you know how have I not heard of this woman before you know why is this not taught in in schools you know why are there not statues to her and so on and so forth Um, and it's been you know it's been amazing to uh, you know, have been able to 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 take her story and to present it in a way that hopefully, you know, lots more people are now going to know her name and are going to know how incredible she was and all the amazing things that she achieved and the phenomenal journey she went on, you know, from housewife to historically significant heroine through this crucible of suffering, being locked up in a 19th century insane asylum when she wasn't mad. Other questions for Kate? Uh, yeah, I'm, I have a question. Just um, obviously the story encompasses such a long time and so many twists and turns and so many separate fights that Elizabeth <laughs> had to fight. How do you go about putting that together other than strictly chronologically? What was what was your approach in terms of putting that together and drawing from her sources so that it came out to be just so readable and and so interesting? I and mean, most of us said earlier you weren't here for the most of us said we just really could not put it down because we had to uh, know amazing. what happened. Um, <laughs> so I'm just you. wondering, like, what what your approach, your process was for that. Sure. Um, Well, thank you for your lovely comments. I'm really pleased that it was readable and informative and you couldn't put it down. Uh, That was the aim. Um, Well, I approach all my books in in the same way, which is that I do all my research first before I write a single word. Um, And as I'm researching, I plot everything in in a chronological timeline. So everything goes in chronologically in just this word document that I have for myself. Um, And it's only once I've plotted everything, I then go back and 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 reread it. It you know all the interesting notes that I've made because obviously you read a source and there'll be you know a, a tiny gem that might be interested in it and the rest of it is 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 not useful. Um. So then I read all the gems that I've put together, and then I create what I call my blueprint for writing the book. And it is incredibly detailed. Um. You know, it's almost a paragraph by paragraph. You know, this is where I'm going to describe the entrance to the asylum. This is where I'm going to put, you know, what drugs they were taking in the 19th century at that time. You know, I I know exactly where all the masses of information are going in the book. Um, And only at that point do I start to write. And, it, it, you know, it can be flexible, you know, with with both the books. Sometimes you get to a thing and you think this chapter is too long. I need to put that information somewhere else. You know, I need to bring this chapter to an end now otherwise people are not going to be interested um and it and it's sort of so it's that dual thing of being a very thorough researcher um having the sort of storytelling brain to put the blueprint together and then also having those storyteller instincts that if the blueprint isn't working you have the freedom uh, and the confidence to say okay well let's let's leave that sort of guide rope behind and and do what feels like the right story to tell it at this stage if you need to deviate from it well you did an amazing job because as we say you know all of us were were just glued to the book for oh, <laughs> i read you. it like two days it was amazing <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> um now martha has said in the comments she says i'm assuming there are other women's stories you encountered in your research yeah yeah it um it was a, quite a while ago now so I mean as I say that there were sort of two strands to my research there was the research to try and find the woman I was going to write about so as I say some of that research took place in the 20th century like I was reading about um Kennedy's sister I think had a had a lobotomy so I was reading about her um you know just just other figures from history you know there, there were cases of women with sort of postnatal depression who ended up lobotomized in hospitals you know things like that um, so there was sort of that element of the research. And then, of course, reading about Elizabeth and her compatriots as well. Um, there was a very good book that I read um, that the name escapes me now, but it's listed in my bibliography that looked at women and madness, <laughs> excuse me, um, across different decades. And it sort of focused on, you know, different characters and almost had mini biographies of them and quoted from their work. It might have been something like, 
it was about their writings um but that was a really interesting um book that they put together because you actually heard from the women themselves it might have been the writing on the wall or something like that I can't remember I'm afraid uh, off the top of my head um mm -hmm. But if you were interested in other women's stories, um, that would be a good place to start. And it, uh, as I say, it it gives a real overview of history. So it had some stories from the 1860s, but it also went later, you know, 1870s, 1890s, into the 20th century as well. Um, and that was publishing, you know, the women's own writings and, and, and describing their case histories as well. So that was a, an interesting book to read uh, as well. Uh, Cindy has her hand up. Uh, yes, I wanted to ask, um, you referenced some of the books that Elizabeth Packard wrote and what she published. Were you able to actually read those documents anywhere? Yeah, um, so her books are available digitally and anyone, if you if you type them into to Google, you can find them. They're available digitally uh, through the trust or um, I think Google Books will have some of them as well. Um, so I was able to read her publications. Um, that, you know, as I say, very easy to find. I was also able uh, in my in research in America to actually see some of the original copies as well um, for the purposes oh. of my research. I used the digital versions, but it was still interesting to see, you know, how you publish these physical objects as well. What what colours did she choose? You know, how how do they come across when you've got a big doorstep um, of a book and so on? So that was special to see the originals, but to read them, you can just find them online. Um, and what was also useful was the asylum published biennial report, which again are available online. Um, mm -hmm. They were published back in the 19th century they did a bind up of them and really granular detail you know how many cows on the asylum grounds how many socks the women darn you know descriptive accounts of what the orchards look like and what buildings been added and you know the dances perhaps that um that the patients enjoyed as part of their sort of social experiences um so there was a wealth of material out there when when you actually started looking uh, Steve, Steve's got his hand up. Yes. Uh, one, one small technical question, and then the other is uh, more about a writing question here, too. You mentioned in your uh, uh, questions at the back regarding your process for putting together and your uh, tools you use for organization. You, you mentioned one called an A4, and I hadn't heard that before. If that's a, a particular tool or something you run into or I just was curious what that was and then the other question uh, uh, I mentioned this to others beforehand uh, but nonfiction I think one of the things that's so difficult is uh, how to draw that line respectfully between when are you you're, you're telling the story uh, you at times seem to be inside the key principal's head mm. and, and how do you uh, decide when you're you don't want to cross that line and be accused of embellishing and yeah. basing you're, you're omniscient here but you really don't know or you have earned the right to sort of kind of know what they're thinking about based on what you're reading so if that makes sense you know, how do you uh balance that yeah um great the, to address the technical thing was it a4 did you say Yes. That was the thing. And um, that's, I think, I think, I can't remember exactly what I said in the, the thing. I think it's just the size of the paper. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you have that they're like just an A4 piece of paper. I think it was it to do with the blueprint when I printed off the blueprint because that's on A4. Um, that's what I meant anyway. I, th I think I'm not a technical person. So I probably just did a printout on A4 paper of oh, uh, what I was I made it more I complicated was than it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not a complicated person, so it wouldn't have been anything anything technical. And in terms of the embellishment and that sort of thing, as I say, I think for me is based on the research. You know, you will find some based on a tr true story sort of books that are very much fiction or are very much taking flights of fancy. I try not not to do that at all. Um, you know, if I'm saying Elizabeth is thinking or feeling it something, it's because I've read it in her notes. There will be points perhaps where I take an idea that she, 
you know, she might even have put sort of one word, um, her writing, that I might then um, have a sort of lyrical flight of fancy with. Like, I think there's um, a bit where she's talking about um, uh, that she's a, a sort of tree or something like that. And I, and I, you know, embellish that in terms of she could feel her roots going down into the earth. She has described herself as a tree in her writing. And then at the moment of that emotional intensity for the reader, I take that tree and I, you know, describe it more for the reader so that hopefully it, it increases the emotional impact and so on. So um, I definitely try not to any thoughts in my, you know, if I don't know what she's thinking, I tend to say that, you know, there's a point uh, when she and McFarland are confronting each other uh, and I sort of say, you know, she, she reacts with strong emotion or something. And I, and I say, you know, did he stand up? Did he shout? Did he, you know, bang the ball? We do not know. She did not. Say. So I tend to only acknowledge if there's a gap, you know, in the sources that we don't know what happened. Um, and as I say, in terms of the thoughts and feelings, I was so lucky and gifted to have Elizabeth's own first person accounts. You know, it was remarkable really how much personal insight I had into her feelings and thoughts, you know, at every step of the journey because she had published them in her memoirs and, and journals. And then the only thing I did really as, as the writer was to choose where am I going to use those beautifully lyrical quotes that she health has given me. And then I had the sort of confidence and the foundation as, as a writer myself to take that seed that she'd given me and and make it flower into something perhaps is more, more impactful for a modern reader. And I've obviously got the distance, you know, she was in the moment living. I've got the distance to say, okay, let's not put that bit in that she's, but let's just use that little seed that will have an impact for readers and hopefully use my skills to make it even more impactful. Um, in the course of my narrative that I've shaped from her life. Um, we've got Thank two, you. we've got uh, Cindy raising her hand and we've got Martha with a question. Uh, Martha, I think's question came in the comments first. Uh, we'll go with her. Uh, she said, it seems it would have been difficult emotionally to write Elizabeth Packard's story. How did um, you handle that? I, I, it was interesting because I wrote the radio first. first um, if people know book is about it's about um these women from the roaring 20s and the first world war who were poisoned with the radium paint that they worked with um and they didn't know that it was the radium paint that was hurting radium at, at that time was seen as this sort of one this cure all um and of course they get radiation poisoning um from using this radium painting and and lipping their lipping and dipping their brush lip pointing um and it's about their journey, you know, to discover making them sick and then to fight for justice to try to hold um, the companies to account for poisoning, crippling and killing them. And so that book was incredibly emotional and heartrending. And I would say that the that comes through so that, yeah that makes so, sense so, yeah. yeah uh cindy you have your hand up uh yeah i had a comment on a4 it uh is the size of the paper in the u.s we have eight and a half by 11 in the uk it's eight and a half by 14 and that's what a4 ah uh, thank you uh, and the, the you guys don't thing, use a4 uh, yeah <laughs> So the other question that I had, you obviously have picked some very emotional stories to tell. And mm -hmm. I wondered, what are you thinking about as you think about your next book? Um, well, I am working on my next book, which is very exciting. Um, I hey. haven't announced what it, what it is yet, <laughs> um, just because I'm the kind of writer I need to sort of live with the characters and the story myself and kind of work out how I'm telling this story and and I find as I research you know stuff comes up that I haven't even 
thought of when I first start on a journey. So I don't I don't like to talk about things too soon until I know exactly what I what it is I am writing. You know, sometimes things surprise you as as, as the the journey progresses. Um, but I would say it is another emotional story. It is another story about women, um, and it's dramatic and there's you know drama in it and 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 heartache and tragedy um and i'm really excited for for readers to to discover the book that i'm writing about and the story that i'm telling but it's very very early days i've i've done my sort of field research as it was i've had several trips in america last year um gathering sources going to the places that i'm going to be writing about um, and now I need to actually just knuckle down and go through, you know, all the thousands and thousands of documents and uh, court records and things that I found um, before. As I say, you know, it's going to be years yet until I've plotted all of that in my timeline and can start to even, you know, think about how I'm going to plot it and, and tell the story. And it's taking a lot longer than the other books because I'm very lucky. I'm a, I'm a mother now. So um, I'm juggling all of this with looking after my, you know, toddler. Um, so it's taking a lot longer than the other books, but I'm, you know, understandably uh, prioritizing being with my son at the moment, and uh, and the book will will happen, but it will happen when it when it happens. You'll have to keep us in the loop. <laughs> yes, I will definitely. And um, speaking of which, actually, if anybody is interested, I do have a, a a newsletter. I don't send it out that regularly, but a couple of times a year. And um, so, and that will be the first place, you know, to go to sort of find any updates. So if people are interested to sign up for my newsletter, uh, you can find it at www.kate-more.com. That's kate-more.com. Um, and there's a newsletter sign up there if anybody is interested to do that. Great. We've got uh, a question from Lisa. She says, do any because her husband was so outraged when she became this successful political campaigner that he sort of waged his own media campaign against her, which included publishing her doctor's letters. You know, his idea was that he would publish McFarlane's letters to try and, you know, do down Elizabeth so that people would think, well, this esteemed doctor is saying she's mad and that this is why she's mad and therefore we won't listen to her politically. Uh, but obviously it's kind of backfired on him um, as I think to some degree it, it did at the time but it, it's meant that I've had this you know wealth of information of, of what the doctor was saying and thinking and, and feeling as well because we've got correspondence um, that was by Theophilus um, there were also um, McFarland himself published medically as well so there's a couple of sort of treaties really on, on you know what he was thinking about you know, treating his patients and what he thought was the best way to to treat his patients and so on. So I was also able to draw on his sort of medical thing as well in, in, in constructive character and, you know, trying to understand what's going on in, in his mind as well. Well, I, I can't remember who it was, but somebody um, earlier mentioned that, um, and, and I totally agree with this, is you, you kind of kept us guessing about McFarland. You know, was, mm. it, was he really on her side or was he trying to fool her? And, you know, that that's one of the things that really kept me engaged in the, in the story, in addition to a lot of other things, but was trying to figure out, you know, where is he in the in the scheme of things? Yeah, definitely. I, I think McFarland and Elizabeth's relationship is so interesting and it, and it, it is the thing that often comes in, in book play, book clubs. Um, and, you know, people often say we were, you know, yelling at the book, you know, don't trust him, Elizabeth, don't trust him. <laughs> you know? But, it, it, you know, you, you just imagine what it was like for, for her, you know, it, to be locked up in that asylum, you know, completely cut off from from friends, from family, from her children. You know, the throw, the key almost literally thrown away. You know, there was she didn't know if she was getting out or not and what that would do to a person psychologically and I think their personalities and the way their characters were together was just such a sort of unique combination um Elizabeth's feelings for him do obviously fluctuate and 
sometimes he is on sometimes he's not and you know her feelings about him were so complicated not least I think this is the real sort of critical thing about their relationship together obviously McFarlane did so many terrible things but the one thing he did do that for Elizabeth was undeniably good was he allowed her to write and it was through writing that she found herself really she found her voice she was able to organize her thoughts um you know found her calling really and and that like, you know in, in even once she gets out of the asylum you know she becomes a writer she makes her wealth and her livelihood through writing and that's the door that McFarland has opened for her and has allowed her to walk through and you know to have that time in the asylum where she was just writing day in day out you know letting the thoughts fly the words flow you know I think it was such a special creative time for her and, and such a critical point in her own personal journey and she can never divorce the fact that McFarlane was the one that you know opened that door for her and gave her that key and so it, despite everything that happens you know even when it becomes evident that he's only done that because he thinks she'll write herself into corner and and write the proof as he sees it that she is mad even once you you know once she realizes all of that you still can't divorce the fact that she became this woman and this writer in part because of him because of the fact that he opened that and so I think she struggled with that and so he was always a part of her because of that as well you know it's it's a it's a really difficult thing isn't it when you've been through a traumatic experience but the traumatic experience has made you who you are as well it, you know you can have quite complicated feelings about that I think yeah indeed uh Steve you got your hand up uh yes I thought your metaphor for describing the relationship sort of the emotional relationship between uh Elizabeth and McFarlane as an emotional dance was was really good, very powerful. Uh, the Thank way those you. two played against each other, and it, she sort of had a uh, decades long search for trying to find a way, a reason in which she could trust him, and uh, eventually reducing it down to there isn't any. But then, yeah. as you said, that she was uh, she did acknowledge the fact that because of. Uh, what he did allow her to do launched the possibilities that came years later. Um, yeah. The other thing I just, to, to you, you mentioned briefly just a few sentences about Mary Lincoln mm. and McFarland's role with, with, with her. And I don't know if you recall a scene in Spielberg's movie, Lincoln, where Lincoln and, and uh, Mary are having a disagreement and uh, he threatens her sort of with sending her away. And I mm -hmm. thought of that when I read your reference to that. And here's Lincoln, who in our eyes has this incredible aura, uh, legendary, mythical. And uh, the script sort of brings him down to level for a brief few seconds that in many ways he was just like any other middle-aged white man of power. Yeah. And, and so your reference to that made, made me think of that. Yeah, that's interesting. I haven't seen the film Lincoln for years. And, you know, it, obviously I came to this story a, a, a long time afterwards. But that's really interesting that that you've seen that and, and that reference. When she was seen by McFarland, it was actually after Lincoln's death. It, and it was her son, Robert, who was putting her away in, in asylum. He had the legal power over her as as her, you know, as her son, um, as that relative. Um, but yeah, really interesting. Thank you for sharing that. All right. Well, it looks like, oh my gosh, it's almost six o'clock here. So uh, I think uh, <laughs> we will call it a night, but what a fantastic uh, discussion we've had. I, I thank everybody for taking part and special thanks to Kate for taking the time in, late in the evening in her time zone to come and join us and, and talk about this amazing book, uh, The Woman They Could Not Silence. And again, I recommend Radium Girls. It's amazing. <laughs> um, so, and we look. I look forward to your your next book. Um, I'm happy you. to sign up for your newsletter for sure. Uh, so, thank you so much. And uh, for next time uh, for our book club, we're going to be doing uh, "When Hell Came to Sharpsburg" by Stephen Cowie. 
And uh, Mr. Cowie is going to be joining us for a discussion of his book. It's the story of the civilians uh, and their impact, the way they were impacted uh, during the Battle of Antietam, uh, which uh, is mm. sort of uh, right next door to our museum in, in Frederick, Maryland. So Antietam is uh, is a battlefield that uh, that's near and dear to, to a lot of our hearts and that we, uh, we really uh, study a lot at the museum. So we thought this book is brand new. Uh, and Stephen's done some amazing research. So that's the next book that we're going to be talking about. Uh, that will be in March. And uh, I thank everybody for uh, for taking part. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. All Tracy. right. Thank you again. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks oh. for reading. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thank you. That's a nuisance.